on the uh, yeah, something. So we have we begun. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to module three. Uh, today we're going to be uh, moving into um, conflict resolution, and we're going to put together a few uh, plays and a few skits using uh, something called forum theater that was invented by Augusto Bawal. So um, uh, we have actually already begun today's lesson, and we are going to, um, at this moment, play a video that's going to show up on the screen. And I have to thank uh, the excellent support persons in this room, namely um, Tyler Lachance. Is it Lachance or Lachance? Uh, uh, uh. Uh, La Chance is the common way to pronounce it. Uh, La Chance is the uh, is is the proper French way to pronounce it. You hear that? What is being said is that we are African, Brazilian, Caribbean, European. So the Catholic Church is very large and diverse. We're going to need to pause this for a little bit. Now start. We have a whole sound system in here. Let me know. Try that. Better? Wilton Gregory used to be up in uh, my area, just across the river in Belleville, Illinois, before he moved to Atlanta. Is the result of the communication of Jesus Christ's message to cultures. We are a people, and that is our gift. We have to increase the audio. I'm not too much of it now. The images are fine, even if we can't hear the audio. So I'll put it back to where it was. So he's talking about interconnected community building, where people are working together in order to um, live their Catholic faith. Of 
She says, intercultural competencies are the capacity to communicate and the capacity to work across cultural boundaries. There's one thing that all of the people you see have in common. They're all Catholic. Okay, we'll use this for the next video. Okay, so that's that. Ah. Uh, the YouTube itself? Right. Um, yeah, it is. See? All the way to the top. So we're good. And then this one's all the way up to smile. All right. So, um, but the, the point of the video is that we're very diverse. We are, if, with a billion Catholics on this planet or more, a billion and change, we have, um, we have 1,000 million of us. That's what a billion is. It's a thousand million. How many people would be rich with one million dollars? Okay, imagine 1,000 million persons. Now, Catholics are about half of the total Christianity, right? There are about two billion Christians on this planet. And that other billion is broken into what? I learned all this from your class, Dr. Tuller. Uh, there's, what, 400,000 Orthodox and 600,000, 400 million Orthodox and 600 million Protestants and Evangelicals and other people who consider themselves to be Christians. So with 7 billion people on the planet, Catholics and non-Catholic Christians represent almost a third of the total planet. The rest of the planet is divided among other faith traditions and among um, those with no faith tradition. So seculars or nuns, N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S. So um, in the United States, about a quarter of our population uh, considers themselves at one point or another to be Catholic. Um, do you know um, how many, if 24% of this country is Catholic, how many of this country was Catholic that left the Catholic Church? About equal. If it's about equal, then that means half the country uh, was uh, baptized at birth as Catholics. Well, God bless us, because we are living in a society uh, where the social structures are not Catholic, where the church is a countercultural phenomenon in this culture, in this society. So how to deal with it? How do you evangelize? in uh, a secular society, and uh, what is um, post-Christian society, what is a pagan society, read the church fathers. Look at what the fathers did in the first few hundred years of the church, and you'll see what it was like to evangelize in a culture where you could actually be eaten by lions or killed by wild animals. You could be martyred.
Today, the martyrdom uh, is sometimes of a different kind. It means that we don't indulge in the culture, and we suffer from it because people will say, hey, wait a second, why aren't you doing X, Y, or Z? These are things that we all do in our culture. And then you have to repeat those wonderful words from the Old Testament, as for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. So many faces in God's house. So let's move on from there. Oh, control L. Woohoo! Oops. Okay. So the face of groups. Uh, we have um, two faces, each of us. We have a face that we personally show the world, and we have a face that we put on when we don't think anybody's watching. So for that face that we show the world, for the way we present ourselves to the world, um, much of this is cultural. The entire culture or the entire group will present itself in a certain way. For instance, sisters, when you come out of the convent, you have your habits. In the convent, you probably don't care so much about wearing, you know, um, uh, the uh, the headpiece and so on. When I come to this campus, I wear a suit. At home in St. Louis, I wear blue jeans to work because at home, my public image is expressed through the media, uh, through uh, email, sometimes through video conferencing, in which case I may have a suit jacket on, but I'm still wearing blue jeans. Because nobody knows. Blue jeans are more comfortable than a suit. Um, so we present in a way we want others to perceive and interact with us. And we do what needs to be done within our group to support that face. So to support what it is, uh, how we present ourselves, how that group presents itself. Okay. Now, remember St. Thomas's rule comes back. St. Thomas is, um, the receiver receives according to mode of reception of the receiver. But the transmitter transmits, to play with it a bit, according to the mode of transmission of the transmitter. I'm going to transmit myself in a certain way, in the way I want others to perceive me. But it's only really going to work if I understand that the other receives according to his or her own mode of reception. So already, in any given encounter, I have to make adjustments if I want the other person to perceive me in the way that I want to be perceived or seen or understood. So we'll try to get this one to play. This is... Um, She's answering the question, what is space? Um, 
we should always uh, supersede our individual self-interest or self-needs. Broadly speaking, U.S. overall, Australia, and many of Northern European cultures have been identified more highly individualistic. In comparison to many of the ancient cultures, the Japanese cultures, Chinese cultures, Korean cultures, many of the Latin American cultures, and also have many African cultures. Uh, according to Shriandas, actually, both of us became, to a global level, almost about 70% or so of the cultures subscribe to some forms of collectivistic values in comparison to maybe less than 30%. So to me, it's very critical to force a very good grasp of the collectivistic value uh, orientations. We are making a video to make a show to students. What if it really turns out poorly and students are just bored, uh, they're bored. I mean, they just, it's not good. We've got some face work to do. What kind of face work as a child of a collectivistic culture would you do? And what kind of face work, if it holds true to form, do you think I would do? If I would play out our own scripts, which although I think we could do that, uh, from a collectivistic angle, I would say, well, it's a play, I'm not really paying attention. It must be really my fault it's because I didn't really set up the context for you uh, with a clear focus on what you should be watching for. So therefore, you are all falling asleep for me. So maybe we'll try again next week. So I'll do some a little bit of self-effacing statement. Alternatively, you, if you, you, you're playing all your individualistic script, I'll say that it's obviously you did read the book three times before you're falling asleep. If you read the book three times and watched this video, you know this video is a brilliant video. So I will ask you again to read the book three times and come prepared to meet those authors halfway. It's compassed to me, but I guess that because we've been a teacher now for I don't know how long they can take it to this point. And I don't think human beings are trapped in the role of the culture. I think we're capable of uh, uh, changing the narrative. You've talked a lot recently about self construal. This is not a household word. But 
And we'll stop there. Uh, those of you who want to uh, Can you cancel that. Um, yeah. There. I oppose it. Uh, trust the state. Very good. I trust the space bar. Oh, that's okay. There. Okay, that's our last video. So, um, did did you hear her? What did she say about uh, about culture and about uh, ways in which cultures interact and about collectivist culture or individualist culture? I know it was hard to hear because of the uh, the sound system. Did anybody pick up on anything? One, uh, culture is very dynamic. Culture is very complex. So when we say that uh, this person comes from an individualistic culture and is therefore individualistic, maybe it's not the case. Maybe that person comes from a very collectivist culture within the greater society. If a person comes from a collectivist culture, does that necessarily mean that they're always going to act like a collectivist? Collectivist cultures, and we'll talk about some, some things in a moment in terms of what they are, uh, tend to um, focus uh, more on relationship building as resolution pro uh, ways to resolve problems. So the important thing is to maintain the relationship more than it is to solve the problem necessarily. You solve the problem by maintaining the relationship. Um, in an individualistic culture, Individualistic cultures are very issue driven. We fix the problem. So the problem is this, we fix it and we move on. We don't care about uh, necessarily um, uh, strengthening the relational bonds of the community uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, coming together as a group to share as much as we care about saving the community by fixing the problem. Men are problem fixers. We hear a problem, usually told to us by somebody who is not a man, and what do we do? We fix the problem. Now, we don't engage in any kind of relational uh, problem solving with the woman who has brought us a problem. We see the answer and we fix the problem. Sometimes when women encounter men and they identify a problem, the woman wants to talk about it. She doesn't want it just to be fixed. I'm doing very broad strokes here, but I know that in my own personal relationship with a woman I know, namely my wife, when, God love you, she brings me a problem, my immediate reaction is to fix the problem. But that's not the way she receives. She wants me to recognize that it's a problem, to validate that it's an important thing to consider in the community, to problem solve together, and to come up with a shared resolution. Wait, Cynthia, have you ever, um, you're smiling, has that uh, been the case in your relationship? I'm a problem solver. You're a problem solver. I'm a problem. Okay, so see? It's, yeah. This is not a cut and dry uh, thing. No. It's a generalization and a stereotype. So as um, our speaker was just saying, uh, there will be um, uh, persons that uh, perhaps act, act outside of the stereotype. So um, predominant values that shape the face of a group. Autonomy. The uh, measure of self-sufficiency within the group. Morality the values by which people live, um, competence. Does the group have the resources itself to solve the problems that are presented to it? Um, a very good African writer, Awikwara Ma, wrote a book called Healers in 2000 Seasons. And he demonstrated that African peoples, at least those about whom he was speaking, have resources to resolve their own problems. 
but sometimes the problems are caused by outsiders, in which case it's difficult to resolve those problems with your own resources when you're in conflict with a group that is, um, that is uh, engaging you from the outside. So to break down what our speaker was just saying, in an individualist culture, um, and I want to preface this uh, with the USCCB gave us a note at the very top of this slide. It says conflict is a natural part of human interaction. Conflict can be an opportunity. Strategy depends on external context, issues, and relationship. So that's the, the strategies. Um, how many of you consider, or how many people would say that conflict can be an opportunity? I have conflict yeah. all the time. I, I consider conflict to be an opportunity myself. Uh, Patrick, you do? In what way? I'd well, like an example. At that point, you can come up with a, you can get people together, whatever X conflict is, and hopefully, through a meeting or a series of meetings or interaction, you can come up with a feasible resolution uh, to that conflict. Mm -hmm. But then what did, uh, you would be doing in getting people together is yes. you would be engaging in a relational uh, conflict resolution strategy. Right. In conflict from an individualist culture, let's say if we were to say the United States is an individualist culture, we're going to focus on issues, we're going to try to resolve those issues, we're going to have a very direct mode of communication. We're going to say, this is a problem, and I'm going to fix it. And our strategies are going to be aggressive, upfront, dominating, in order to win in conflict situations. This is a stereotype. It's a generalization. Americans want to win more than, and, and part of winning is solving the problem more than necessarily what collectivists want to do. A collectivist culture will consider um, that it's not an issue that's at stake, but a relationship. The concern is not to resolve the issue, but to maintain face. That people in a collectivist culture want to maintain uh, the, um, the balance in that relationship. And that's part of maintaining face. The mode is indirect. When I lived in North Africa, nobody who had a problem with me ever brought that problem to me. They brought it to a friend of theirs who would then bring the problem to me. So I learned how to communicate very indirectly in problem resolution. Because I knew if somebody else brought the problem to me, that person was not bringing the problem to me because that person had the problem with me. A different person had the problem with me, and that person was simply the intermediary. So very indirect. Strategies. Sometimes avoidance. In a collectivist culture, they'll work around the problem. They'll work around the issue, rather than hit it head on. Um, they elude the conflict topic, the conflict party, or the conflict situation. Oh, I have a problem with this particular individual. I won't go around that particular individual anymore. I'll find a workaround. But that doesn't uh, fix the issue because it's not a question of fixing the issue. It's a question of maintaining the relationships. You know, uh, in that case, uh, that could be a relationship they don't want to maintain. Or they can't because of one thing or another. Obliging or accommodating the other party's concern above one's own. Uh, that is a way to resolve the issue. It's called a lose-win. Americans like the win. Sometimes Americans like the win-lose. Where I win, I don't care if you lose. The best situation is what Father Mosey's always talking about, the win-win. Everybody wins. And therefore, you've got everybody in the community who is happy and is able to move forward. But the lose-win is when I just give up. And I say, you know, I'm just forget it. Let whatever happened happen, or stay the way it is. 
Um, and then the last one is use intermediaries to resolve conflictual situations. That's so. Yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. As I'm looking at this, I can see where this could work either way. Mm -hmm. On the individual basis, you know, you have a little family, maybe your neighborhood. I want to know what would happen if you had race riots in a collectivist society, right? So individualist here, we have a race riot. It's like, okay, we've got to fix this, right? We, because we're going to kill each other off, right? Over here, we don't do anything. We just all avoid it. I mean, there's something really. There's missing. It's mixing, missing something. At the higher level, the more societal level. I, I think in a race riot, and we just had one in St. Louis. I know. That's why I was thinking. Right. Yeah. So uh, you you had a hurricane bearing down on you. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different kind of natural um, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. In St. Louis, um, we had a, uh, a, a storm of a different kind. We had a white police officer who was found not guilty on charges of murder of a black man. And when that happened, uh, it caused um, a tense situation in St. Louis whereby many um, black persons and some white supporters expressed their displeasure at that verdict. They threw rocks, they threw bricks, and um, they caused some trouble. Uh, now, I say they, and I say, you know, it's very easy to use us, them terminology. So an individualist um, would fix the problem. A collectivist would try to resolve the relationship. But it's not cut and dry like that, is it? It's, it's, it's a great deal more dynamic than that, especially if the culture that's protesting is the collectivist culture. And the culture that against whom they're protesting is an individualistic culture. And you can see that in the race riot, perhaps in St. Louis. You can see that in whole revolutions in developing countries that were colonized by um, European powers. So yeah, consider um, Vietnam and the colonization that occurred by France and perhaps the United States as well. Perhaps the United States. And by the United States as well. Um, Korea. Uh, the entire um, Arabic uh, Islamic world was at one point encircled and colonized, uh, cut into pieces, and uh, turned into zones of influence by European powers. That did nothing to improve relations between uh, Christian Europe and uh, Muslim uh, Middle East or Islamic Middle East. And that's just the 22% of the persons in the Middle East, uh, or that's the persons in the Middle East who happen to comprise 22% of the Islamic population. That's not counting the rest of the Islamic population. But in those case of those countries, uh, there was a difficulty. All of Africa was colonized by Europe. So you have collectivist cultures in uh, what we would consider non-European countries encountering individualist cultures in European countries. One might say that a lot of problems occur when individualists and collectivists come together. So how can individualists and collectivists come together in a responsible and meaningful way? Well, first, they have to have some interest in relationships. The individualists who are going into countries and trying to control them really don't want a relationship. What do they want? They want to exploit the yes, exactly. human and material and economic yeah. resources of those of those areas. Yeah. So how would you ever get any kind of solution to conflict like that? All right. When that happens, the group that goes in for the exploitation is entering into that area in a predatory manner. Right. And is it uh, necessarily a good thing to be a predator? Well, no. But that doesn't mean anyone's going to give it up. Right. Yep, the tiger does not change its stripes. Right. So the predator is actually getting something out of it. Mm -hmm. Because if he weren't doing it, if he weren't getting something out of it, he would find a different strategy or different tactic. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, in that case, you have a predation that's occurring. But behind the predator, at least in the uh, developing world, what did we see follow? 
What? Talking about liberation from. Well, eventually you end up with liberation from the predators. Right. Um, missionaries. Yes. So how does an individualist culture colonize a collectivist culture? I mean, this is an issue in terms of our missionary encounter with the world, because we, as Catholics, uh, we're not always. Um, on, perhaps on the right side. Consider uh, the native, uh, uh, the Aboriginal Americans. And it took, uh, what, Montesinos to stand up and say, uh, these are people too. <laughs> Why are you enslaving them? If you are Catholic, then you should not have slaves. And liberated, uh, in so doing, um, liberated part of the world there. Um, so, uh, so it's difficult. Uh, the question that you ask is something that we have to act out. So thank you. I will um, simply move on to the enacting. What we're going to do is we're going to describe a conflict. And you've already got one. So um, conducting meetings. So we're about to have a meeting. Um, individualist styles, collectivist styles. And we're going to describe a conflict situation, and we're going to use that mutual invitation process that we talked about in Module 1. That's where uh, somebody will assume the role of a leader at the table, and that person will invite somebody else to speak, and the person who is speaking will invite somebody else to speak. But the key in mutual invitation is listening, not speaking. So um, we have... Um, we should have, uh, can we break this into three groups? Because really we only need three plays, and that's what we're going to have time for at the end. Um, if this table would divide among the other three tables. So, um, and you might be able to see what I'm doing. I'm making certain that there's at least one American at each table. Of Vietnamese. Now we've already got Daniel over there, but um, Daniel, I don't mean to. Um, are you Canadian by chance? No. Okay. Right. That's okay. You're you're still good. So, correct. South America, you're still an American. So, thank you. So, if you would uh, sit here at this table with the sisters, and uh, Dr. Trulin, yes. um, you can sit anywhere you like, and uh, Tyler, you can sit anywhere you like. If you'd like to sit here with uh, these sisters, that would be fine. And Dr. Tulin, if you'd like to sit here with Patrick. Oh, that'll work, or there. If you would take uh, sit with this, or it doesn't matter, either table. Choose one. Woo! All right. Um, okay, so what I want you to do is come up with one conflict situation. One situation where you perceive conflict. So Dr. Tillin, you've got one. Race riots. And you've got an example, St. Louis. If, you, if your table wants to do that, so just present it, see if anybody else at the table has a conflict that they would like to do, and then choose among yourselves the best conflict situation. I'll give you uh, three minutes. Oh, just take that one. spot for the conflict. For example, my people, they consider my American, they do not ask Thank you, Aaron. All right, for the viewing audience, uh, what we're doing is we've divided the room into three tables. 
We're going to come up with three conflict situations, and they're going to script them out and then enact them. So that'll be the balance of this uh, module, this class. So we're departing a little bit from module three uh, in terms of uh, table activities to come up with some plays that may actually engage us more um, uh, effectively um, and intentionally in uh, what it is that we're trying to discover about the interaction uh, between individualist and collectivist cultures. Again, that's a very broad kind of um, it's a very broad kind of um, dichotomy, uh, uh, division of persons, but it's it's what we've got to work with in module three. All right. Very loud. Very loud. Very Eating. Eating. So that's How about interaction? Mm -hmm. so we is, uh, for example, in the crack, when we make maybe. A, I so a certain, uh, important decision for uh, collective. Usually, they make the decision that uh, have the benefit for everybody. It's about the whole group. Yeah. And Individual, the, maybe not that yeah. way. Or someone you could in, in give a push think that the no matter what you say, the person may make, I, 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 still make I, one decision. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But in what reason? Most of the elements of Asian people come in and white people come in and they 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 you see, from my perspective of what I've seen over the years being in American culture, you know, except if you go way, way back, mm -hmm. Asians and, and Caucasians get on quite well yeah. with each other. And, yeah. yeah, in fact, you know, I don't know, when I was in the Army, I don't know an Asian man and an Asian woman that wasn't married to a white person. <laughs> <laughs> However, so however, I don't know. However, <laughs> in World War II, one of their spouses was not Asian. That's in World War II, uh, there was a, there was there was the issue of 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 the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor, and from uh, from from that point from that point on. Um, and and it, oh, it's, it's ended. It's ended to, uh, in this in this uh, day and age. Um, it's um, it was the problem of. And um, I think uh, this uh, uh, the this is the happen also in the, in in the Paris when we do the Basro Ministry for uh, Vietnamese Paris because we have a uh, uh, three uh, generations. Now we have a three generation. Um, grandparents, parents, and their children. Yeah. 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 And do you have a conflict? Yeah. Um, my hometown, um, people uh, come to church very early. Four, four a.m. Oh, yeah, yeah. four a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. ring bell. Mm -hmm. Very early. Uh, the second, uh, uh, in the evening, uh, um, in the family, pray uh, prayer together. That's very different from here. Yeah, yeah. 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 Do you have a right? It's kind of it's really sticking in my in my mind, just uh, because it is such a strain in our country's history.
and so much repeats itself. So many of the same mistakes and sins on both sides. So um, we should probably vote on what we're going to talk about. I guess that's an American way of doing it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so we have uh, different ways of interacting, and we have uh, intergenerational. And, uh, with you, we have a different way of worship. Um, so those are those are three very good. So maybe we could just decide which one we want to talk about. I take it you come from a more collectivist culture. Yeah. We tend to take charge, I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't do it on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but right, but I mean that would if if I decide to have a party uh, yeah. all through the night, someone might call the police yeah, on yeah. me as well. So that in itself is not I mean unfortunately Americans call the cops on each other all the time. Yeah. So it I, I wouldn't that incident in itself would not tell me that yes. you know that person would have probably done that to anybody else. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So I, I I don't know. I would not convinced that that person was necessarily did being discriminatory. Well, the, he was, but it had nothing to do with him being Vietnamese. It was probably, he would have did that to his white neighbor as well. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Yes, I know. Right. So like a lot, a lot of times there's an ordinance they have a law that after 10 o'clock in the neighborhoods, it's quiet hour. So if you start continuing to have a huge party, you know, one of your neighbors has every right by law to call and have the police come and tell you to uh, lower your music, cut it, cut it down, this, that, and the other thing. Although I've experienced it myself when I was a teenager, you know, uh, house parties and stuff like that and that like is starting that different because life of Vietnamese if I have party if we all Vietnamese the whole uh, neighborhood would come and enjoy us maybe so we don't call the police like that. well I mean I, I mean there certainly <laughs> yeah. certainly there was uh, there was a transition in our own society where it became much more individualistic yeah. Yeah. and there certainly there was more of a collectivists or group mentality where that stuff used to, I remember when I was a child that used to happen where, you know, the, the parties in the neighborhoods, um, block parties, block parties. Yeah. And then, you know, if you, you look at the subcategories of Caucasians, everyone may have been of the same ethnic background, same, like, and you know some some business men, they understand the, the conflict in the white and black or Asia and like in this area.